anime is often defined as animation originating from Japan. But that wasn't always the definition. See, anime as we know it today didn't exist until the 1950s. So what was happening in Japanese animation for the first half of the century? And how did we end up where we are today? Well, to get a clear image of where Japanese animation came from, we have to go back. Way back. Back to the 11th century. The 11th century is where we can find the main predecessor of anime, Imakimono. Imakimono is basically a really long scroll with multiple paintings on it. These paintings tell a story. Over the next few hundred years, the art would evolve and expand. And by the 13th century, one branch of this art had evolved into manga. Skip ahead a few hundred years and we can find the earliest example of animation in Japan. It's a short 50 frame animation of a boy writing the kanji for Katsudo Shashin. This animation is believed to have been produced between 1907 and 1911, which predates the next example of Japanese animation by about a decade. From there, most early animation was used for public relations and public projects in general. These are what initially gave anime a stake in the Japanese entertainment field. Unfortunately, that stake did not hold for very long, as the Kanto earthquake in 1923 posed a huge setback for the industry due to the damages to animation centers. It is around this time that notable animators began to emerge. To this day, the most impactful one is Ofuji, as he set the standard frame rate for all anime at 24 frames per second. This was determined because he and Masawaka Kenzo could not get a hold of the equipment to record at 32 frames a second due to it being foreign made. During the 1930s, nationalism swept over Japan, and many animators were pressured to create propaganda animations, or animations that fed into the Japanese spirit. As World War II began, animated films were commissioned by the Imperial Japanese Army. These were used to promote Japanese morale and create an image of Japanese forces deftly defeating their enemies. As a result of World War II, Japan introduced a new article into their constitution, banning the country from using war to settle state disputes, and stating that Japan Japan could not have an army capable of warring. This article will be important later in the video, so be sure to stay tuned if you want to see how. From there, animation started to really take off in Japan. This is when we enter the modern era of Japanese animation, and animation originating from Japan became known as anime. The first anime was created in 1958 with Legend of the White Snake. It was a movie produced by Toei Animation, a studio that would later employ animation greats such as Osamu Tezuka and Hayao Miyazaki. Tezuka would go on to form Mushi Productions, leading to the creation of Princess Knight, a pioneering shoujo anime, and Astro Boy, which was apparently inspired by the time Tezuka got punched in the face by an American soldier while in a hospital. So I guess you could say, in a way, America is responsible for the next 60 years of animation. You're welcome. This decade also garnered the emergence of many anime magazines, such as Weekly Shonen Magazine. During the early 60s, we saw the emergence of anime-styled characters, with a large heads and large eyes. The 60s also saw the continued success of Astro Boy and Mushi Productions. In fact, Mushi Productions was responsible for the first anime broadcast in the United States. Based on my research, it seems that this anime was Astro Boy, but I had a hard time confirming that. Astro Boy was influential on the anime industry as a whole, and it led to a lot of anime about robots and space being produced in the 60s. We also see the first Magical Girl anime being produced in 1966, that being Salty the Witch. And we also saw the first shoujo sports anime, Attack No. 1. The late 60s brought the anime Speed Racer to the United States with great success. And in 1968, the now popular manga magazine Shonen Jump began production. The 60s also saw the creation of the longest running anime ever created. Saze-san follows a woman named Saze-san as she goes through her everyday life in Tokyo, Japan. The anime is still airing new episodes to this day and has over 2,500 episodes with 7,500 segments. Unfortunately, the success that the anime industry saw in the 60s did not continue into the 70s. The industry saw a bit of a decline in anime popularity due to competition from live-action television. This resulted in toy animation reducing staff, including Miyazaki, who moved to A-Pro and later Nippon Animation. This live-action competition also resulted in Mushi Productions going bankrupt, albeit briefly. During that time of bankruptcy, 
many of the animators at Mushi went on to form their own studios, such as Sunrise Studio and Madhouse. This reorganization of the anime industry may have been a good thing in the end, as it allowed for more experimentation and for more younger talent to assume directorial roles. The 70s also saw anime reach European audiences for the first time with anime such as Barba Papa and Vicky the Viking. But overall, the 70s were kind of a quiet moment in anime history. The most notable events were the emergence of Mecha and Gundam anime and Miyazaki leaving Nippon animation towards the end of the decade. While there, Miyazaki directed the acclaimed show Future Boy Conan. Despite this decline in anime, manga was still very successful, specifically shoujo manga. As the decade progressed, the genre started to reflect the efforts of the women's liberation movement and the fight for sexual freedom. These shoujo authors even pioneered the gay romance genre Shonen Ai. The shoujo genre saw another major commercial success during this decade, that being The Rose of Versailles. The 1980s were kind of a renaissance era for anime. The visual quality increased and the stories became more nuanced and complicated as the decade went on. It was also the decade where otaku culture began to form in Japan, which resulted in more manga magazines coming into creation. The international success of Star Wars in the decade prior created a boom of Gundam anime in the 80s. These were created in similar space opera styles and were very popular in the decade thanks to the predecessors in the 70s such as Mobile Suit Gundam. The 1980s also saw the creation of OVAs or original video animations. These OVAs were distributed specifically for home video on VHS so they were not available on TV or in theaters. In 1986 we see the creation of the one and only Dragon Ball which popularized the martial arts genre and paved the way for many anime to come. This decade also holds the record for the most expensive anime film at the time, that being Royal Space Force Wings of Hanamai's from the studio Gainax, which was quickly surpassed by Akira. Despite being an ambitious project, Akira failed domestically in Japan, but now it is regarded as somewhat of a cult classic in the West, and it has a large international fan base. You might have noticed that there is still one major player in the anime industry that we have not talked about yet. One studio that would revolutionize the industry as a whole. In 1985, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind premiered. It received praise from critics and fans alike. This success allowed the directors to create their own animation studio. Those directors were Hayao Miyazaki and Isao Takahata. The studio was Studio Ghibli. Studio Ghibli would go on to produce three anime movies in the 80s. Laputa Castle in the Sky, Grave of the Fireflies, and Kiki's Delivery Service, which would be the highest grossing film of 1989 in Japan. The 1980s also saw the beginning of Western fandoms for anime. Many people who grew up in the 1960s and 70s now recognized that what they were watching was anime and they wanted to get more of it. At this point, the only way to do that was to go on Online and use a tape trading network with Japanese fans. These tapes had to be fan subbed as they were not exactly being distributed via legal means. The end of this renaissance period of anime was noted by three major events the bursting of Japan's economic bubble, the failure of Akira, and the death of Osama Tezuka. The 1990s saw a decline in anime matching the decline of the Japanese economy. Many studios shrank in size and the number of anime produced was overall lower than in the 1980s. However, there were still notable events in the 90s that would affect the anime industry for years to come. The 90s saw rise to the first anime conventions in the Western world, and in 1992 Sailor Moon released to large success. In 1995, an earth-shattering anime was released. Neon Genesis Evangelion was probably the most influential anime of the decade. It became popular among anime fans and even garnered mainstream media attention as well. Evangelion has been credited with changing the way Japanese animation was approached. It beckoned in an era of author control and changed the technical and artistic approaches to anime as well. This resulted in anime producing less episodes overall but at a much higher production quality. The show also brought brought around discussions of making anime more internationally accessible, especially towards younger audiences. Which is kind of weird, considering Evangelion also spurred conversations about censorship in anime due to its intense violence and sexual themes. But Evangelion wasn't the only thing to happen in the 90s. In 1997, Princess Mononoke was released, and from what I can tell, it was the first major anime film to use CGI. Around the same time, the Pokemon anime began in Japan, and it aired in the United States a year later 
feature on the newly launched Toonami program blog on Cartoon Network. Thanks to the success of the games, this would introduce anime to a lot of new young fans. At the same time, One Piece began airing in Japan, however it wouldn't be licensed for a US release until 2004. And finally, a 1999 edition of Hunter x Hunter began airing in, well, 1999. While the decade did not start out on a strong note for the anime industry, by the end of it, the industry was growing as a whole. Thanks to the success of the aforementioned anime, as well as Dragon Ball Z, Digimon, and more. Evangelion's influence on the anime industry stretches into the 2000s. As the 2000s saw a rise in mecha anime in an attempt to revive the 1970s series. There were many of these new mecha series, but the most notable one was Gurren Lagann, which won multiple awards in 2008. But we have a lot more anime to talk about before we get to 2008. One of the most notable moments of the decade was the live broadcasting of Cowboy Bebop on Adult Swim in 2001. The show was successful in the West right off the bat. The only downside was the small audience due to being broadcast late at night. 2002 saw the release of Spirited Away, the critically acclaimed Studio Ghibli movie. Spirited Away would win the Academy Award for the Best Animated Feature Film and it was the first non-American film to do so. The most important revelation of the 2000s was the focus on anime adapted from manga and light novels. Many popular anime followed this format, including Naruto, Death Note, Bleach, Full Metal Alchemist, and more. Another important event of the 2000s was the creation of Crunchyroll in 2006. Crunchyroll would become the first widely available online streaming service, and many companies would go on to copy this concept in later decades. The 2000s also saw a rise in anime-inspired shows, most notably Avatar The Last Airbender and Teen Titans. This helped give anime an even deeper hold on US households. While the first half of the decade was very eventful, the second half was quite a bit quieter. For the most part, the second half was dominated by the big three. Naruto, Bleach, and One Piece dominated the manga and anime industries as a whole. While this time was great for fans of these shows, they did kind of suffocate the shonen space. Not to the extent that it was a negative on the industry or anything like that, but it did limit the amount of new series that could air or be serialized in Shonen Jump for a large amount of time. The end of the decade was punctuated punctuated by the run of the critically acclaimed anime Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, and over the next few years, the popularity of anime would increase steadily. At this point in the 2010s, the majority of domestically successful anime would get international licensing, and many of those would get multi-language dubs. Many fans consider the 2010s the decade that anime grew up in terms of theming and messaging, but it's hard to say if that is necessarily true when we look at the growth over the 80s and 90s. The decade was punctuated by a number of successful shonen anime including another edition of Hunter x Hunter, My Hero Academia, and one shrouded in controversy. That being Attack on Titan, which began in 2013. 2013 also marked the end of Miyazaki's time at Studio Ghibli with the film The Wind Rises. Both Attack on Titan and The Wind Rises created debate surrounding the ninth article of the Constitution of Japan. The political right was critical of The Wind Rises, as it has an anti-war message and was critical of Japanese military endeavors. I need to put a disclaimer here, I have never seen this movie, this information was collected during research, and I will link my sources in the description below. On the other hand, Attack on Titan was criticized for being pro-military. This criticism mostly came from other Asian countries. One reason for this claim was the character Dot Pixis, who was heavily inspired by a colonizing general of South Korea. This was a general that the author even looked up to at the time. Obviously, if you've seen the show, you will see that the message is pretty anti-war, as conflicts will just lead to more conflicts later on. Attack on Titan was also later controversial in the West for being anti-Semitic due to symbolism and parallels regarding a certain party. I personally do not believe Attack on Titan is anti-Semitic, but I think it's important to mention when talking about the anime due to its popularity. As the decade went on, more and more streaming services picked up anime. Netflix and Amazon Prime were both major players and increased their stakes in the anime industry. The decade was capped off with the release of Demon Slayer which became an instant international success, breaking records in Japan and worldwide. And now we're at present day, the 2020s, the age of COVID and late-stage capitalism. 
One of these was good for anime. Actually, they probably both are. COVID-19 demanded people spend more time inside and less time doing things. This created a huge boom in popularity for all kinds of online culture, including anime and manga. The rising popularity of TikTok also played a role in creating new anime fans. As the app grew exponentially, the fan bases grew as well. The decade has already yielded quite a few critically acclaimed anime, including Jujutsu Kaisen, Spy X Family, and Tokyo Revenge. Avengers. The rest of 2022 and 2023 look to be great for anime and manga alike. With the premiere of Chainsaw Man, a new season of My Hero Academia, the final 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 season of Attack on Titan, Demon Slayer Season 3, Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2, and the end of hiatuses for Berserk and Hunter x Hunter. It is also very possible that the final piece of the big three will be ending in the coming year, but Bleach is also coming back, so we can't really escape. And with that, we have covered the entire history of anime. I know I probably missed a lot of important shows along the way, but I didn't want this video to just be me listing anime for 25 minutes, you know? So if you think I missed any major points in anime history, be sure to let me know in the comments down below. Thank you all for watching, be sure to subscribe, join the discord, and leave a like. I'll see you again next week.